Hi, everyone. Uh, here with me right now is Ted Miller, professor at Northeastern University, author of the upcoming book, A Conspiratorial Life, Robert Welch, The John Birch Society, and The Revolution of American Conservatism. And uh, he's joined me to discuss his, new, his piece in The New Republic, The John Birch Society Never Left. Uh, thanks so much for, for joining me today, Ted. Oh, it's a great pleasure to be here. Uh, your piece was fascinating. We were talking a little bit before the show, just how cyclical all of these right-wing narratives are and how much you can learn from history, really, when studying anything, but in this case, uh, the modern Republican Party and the modern conservative movement. So just let's start broadly. Can you explain a brief history of the John Birch Society for people who may not know and Robert Welch and his role in it? Um, because I'll just briefly say, it seems to kind of be um, the few decades past equivalent of some of the conspiracy peddling that we're seeing with QAnon uh, in today's right wing. Yes, absolutely. Uh, the John Birch Society was a far right organization uh, that was begun by a candy maker, the candy maker who created such childhood favorites as the Sugar Daddy and uh, the jun Junior Mints um, in the late 1950s. I uh, love Junior Mints. That's so unfortunate. Ju junior Mints are, are wonderful in the in the movies, and and it, I don't know if you're going to have them ever again in the movies after that. <laughs> yeah, I may not. <laughs> um, the um, but the John Birch Society was an organ, a far right organization that. Um, there was a sort of a myth behind it that it was purged from the conservative movement by William F. William F. Buckley because of the conser um, conspiracy theories associated with the John Birch Society. Uh, Robert Welch said that uh, Dwight Eisenhower was a communist, and Robert Welch said that um, the civil rights movement was run by the communists, and Robert Welch said. Um, that there, well, well, it was a conspiracy to put um, fluoride in drinking water, and that could lead you to communism. Um, there were uh, many, many other conspiracy theories um, that Robert Welch um, got involved in, and and uh, there was a myth that Buckley purged him from the society, and I, I don't think that's the case. In my new book, I'm going to say that it, it continued well into the 1970s. In fact, the 1970s were the high points, was the high point of the John Birch Society when it serves as a, a beacon for the moral majority in the coming Reagan revolution. So yeah, I want to go into Ronald Reagan for sure, but first we have to start with William F. Buckley, who um, people may remember he was involved in those uh, infamous slash famous Gore Vidal debates that were televised, I believe, on ABC. Um, he yeah. was kind of seen as a more mainstream version of conservatism, and he had a very colorful personality, uh -huh. a lot of uh, conservatives cite him, and, you know, infamously Donald Trump I keep saying that word, but it was uh, in the 2016 presidential debates when Ted Cruz was going after New York values. Uh, Donald Trump very artfully cited oh, William right. Buckley as being from New York. I yes, it was, a, it was a very good line um, by him, by the way. And it's just why he was effective in those Republican primaries, which is shown yeah. through there, in my view. Um, but but William F. Buckley uh was seen as a hero by a lot of conservatives. Can you talk about his role as related to the John Birch Society and why? Sure, sure. He gave them a, a, a voice and a face to divorce the conspiracy peddling from the conservative movement well, at the time. Um, Bill Buckley um, was a great storyteller. Um, he was probably the, one of the most prolific writers of the 20th century. And he created a myth. Um, he liked myth. He was like he was like Beowulf killing the dragon Grendel. Grendel being the JBS, the John Birch Society, purging it from the conservative movement. He was a powerful debater, a masterful debater, powerful writer, and he was a historical gatekeeper. And he provided limited access to his papers when he was alive. 
So he systematically underplayed um, this continued influence of the Birchers, but he was also a politician and politicians tell stories. They create myths. Um, he, he in fact dreamed of elective office. He once ran for mayor of New York. He loved to hold court to reactionaries and liberals on his sailboat or in the warm mountain cabins of Aspen or, or Switzerland. He charmed liberals like Kenneth, uh, John Kenneth Galbraith and Norman Mailer. Uh, he would hobnob with um, uh, Vice President Humphrey. He could be all things to all people. And so he honed the arts of a politician uh, with great subtlety and sophistication, but at the same time, he's carrying out this project of giving the conservative mainstream respectability while moving the center of American politics um, as far to the right as, as practically possible. Um, but there never really was a purge um, of, of the John Birch Society. In fact, um, you could argue that um, William F. Buckley, um, even though he established his credibility as a member of the responsible right, um, made statements on race and Africa that were even far more incendiary and racist than anything Robert Welch had ever said. Well, well you cite that in your piece, right? So that yeah. Buckley once called Africans semi-savages who uh, could not govern themselves, uh, who only if they stopped eating each other. That was uh, that was one of the quotes that you cited yeah. I, that I wrote down. Um, that, that's and, worse. That, yeah. I mean, he says worse. He says, he says that, um, well, I don't know if it's worse. I mean, but it's, um, he says that, um, the 14th and 15th amendments are inorganic accretions tacked on to the constitution by the victors at war by force. I mean, that, that's the, those are important amendments, the right to, to vote for African-Americans, uh, the 14th and 15th amendments. Um, he, I, you, he, you can go on and on. He said that um, in his essay, why the South must prevail, that the white community is so entitled to take measures to prevail politically, because for the time being, it is the advanced race. So um, th this is the stuff he was saying. Well, e explicit white supremacy. And uh, that's so that's my real question to you is you you highlighted very well how Buckley was a gifted orator and he had a quick wit and he was kind of a trash talker. So in that way, Trump does echo a lot of what William F. Buckley um, presented in, in, in terms of a media presence. Um, and then behind the scenes, he was able to make conservatism more palatable for more respectable intellectual types. But there is a, outside of the history of, of Buckley, in my view, a constant compulsion on a part of the elites and media to normalize conservatism despite these conspiratorial elements that Buckley himself, as you outlined, um, was as extreme as the less reputable John Birch Society. So can you talk about why that dynamic exists in your view? Why the, um, why the, um, there's this compulsion among, um, say, Beltway conservatives to emphasize this more moderate aspects of conservatism conservatism to the um, and avoiding the race you mean yeah well i was actually even saying beltway media like there, beltway media okay. there is a desire even of mainstream folks yeah to to normalize conservatism even okay. when there, these elements were always in existence well i think one problem is reagan one problem is reagan reagan is a is a master raconteer right he, he's a um he's charming he possessed a knack for expressing dark plots and um, some very uh, nasty things behind a warm smile and a humble Midwestern demeanor. I mean, he, he was my president growing up. I grew up in the 1980s. I remember um, his, his um, demeanor. Um, but um, I, I think that the Beltway intellectuals failed to hear the dog whistles. That's another, that's another um, thing that's going on. 
there's a lot of cognitive dissonance when it comes to Ronald Reagan. They, Reagan was such a transformative figure, transformational figure that I don't think people see what they, I think people hear what they want to hear and see what they want to see when it comes to Reagan. William Sapphire, George Will, Cal Thomas, right? Um, the Beltway um, media. Um, they are going to focus instead of the on the racist stuff. They're going to focus on the conservative intellectual triumvirate of uh, libertarianism under Hayek, von Mises, uh, the traditionalists like Russell Kirk, the anti-communists like Whitaker Chambers, and there is a significant uh, intellectual tradition. Uh, but they fail to hear Reagan's um, dog whistles out of. Um, because of cognitive dissonance and because of another thing I think that was going on at the time, and that's the colorblind conservatism. Um, that helps them look the other way too. Well, I'm uh, reminded of the same dynamic now. I uh, The whole intellectual dark web, I'm not sure if you're familiar with this dynamic, but the whitewashing of a extremism of a Ben Shapiro, for example, yeah. or just like yeah. other... You know, Ben Shapiro could be, uh, you could draw a comparison to Buckley in some some situations. But I want to expand on that Reagan point because you outline in your piece, and I'm sure in your forthcoming book, um, all of these ways that Reagan was totally off his rocker in terms of right-wing conspiracy theories that he seems to have plucked from uh, the John Birch Society. Uh, he, uh, well, the explicit racism, he called members of the African United Nations uh, monkeys. He uh, had the conspiracy theories that uh, former President Gerald Ford staged assassination attempts. Um, he said that the Soviet Union got rid of 20 million young people um, in order to to launch nuclear war. This is some of the things some of the things that you outline. Um, these are outrageous, nonsensical uh, claims. Um, and then uh, he also, uh, you wrote, uh, took a conspiracy theory right out of the John Birch Society about Lenin. Can you talk about why that's never a part of the conversation? Is it just Reagan's charm or is it kind of that same impulse that we were discussing before? Well, I, I think that it, it has a lot to do with that sense of, um, you know, they they make a decision about Reagan and they go with it. But he's a he is he is a phenomenal politician. I mean, it, he is a I, I think it has to do with Reagan that it's his his ability to charm um, people who walk into the the Oval Office speak of not liking him when you know you first entered the room but then when they leave the uh, the oval office they are are enamored with the man and but he had that incredible ability to charm but some real nastiness behind the scenes it's, it's not only um if, if you'd like me to to go into a little bit more detail about the yeah sure um some of the other things that some of the other things that he does um, he begins his um, his campaign in the same um, area of the South, where three civil rights volunteers, James Cheney, Andrew Goodman, and and Michael Schwerner, Schwerner, of course, were killed 16 years earlier during Freedom Summer, um, and. You know why did he why did he begin um, at this particular point? Um, well, he launched his presidential campaign in this county because he knew that's where you could get the Wallace voters. Um, and when he got there, um, a you know he was cheered on. Um, you know they were all yelling Reagan, Reagan. This is Neshoba. This is the Neshoba County Fair. And they were all yelling, we want Reagan. He comes back four years later. He says, I believe in states' rights. Um, and, you know, it, 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 it's, he goes on and on. He, he talks about Chicago welfare queens 80, with 80 names and 30 addresses. And 
12 social security cards who are collecting veterans benefits and four, these are all quotes, by the way, with, with four non-existing deceased husbands. She's got Medicaid getting food stamps and she is collecting welfare under each of her names. Her tax-free cash income is over 150,000. That, that would be a quote from Reagan. Um, and of course, you mentioned plenty with the, uh, the United Nations quotes. It, it just it goes on and on. Um, and can you as, touch on that Lenin story? Because just to bring it back to the John Birch Society and why, uh, as you posture in your piece, it never left. Um, seems like yeah. Reagan got his foreign policy theories straight from uh, their books as well. Yes, uh, Robert Welch met in Indianapolis, and he gave a uh, he gave us a, a two day speech with eleven other. Um, 11 other leaders of business. Um, it was over a weekend. Uh, and he, one part of the speech, he, he gave, he offered a quote from, supposedly it's from Lenin. Lenin never said it. It was a made up quote that um, communism would not be, there would not be an invasion. The United States would simply fall under the charm of, of communism and pretty soon we would become a communist nation. We would, a, 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 a single shot would not be fired. Uh, Reagan repeated the exact same thing that Robert Weld said in the first meeting of the John Birch Society. And it was uh, made and, up, and it was made up. And it was made up, and it was made up. And it, and it was made up. He continued to, to say this on, um, in many campaign, campaign stops um, along the way, because he was running for president for a long time throughout the late 1970s. He's, he's, um, he fails to win in 76 and he's running all through um, the Carter's years. Yeah, so. Yeah, I think that's just a fascinating story because it just shows how, you know, information gets repeated, believed, even if it's not true. And yeah. of course we saw the same dynamic with Donald Trump, Breitbart, yeah. put it up on Breitbart. Put it up on uh, what was a gateway pundit. Put it up on, on Infowars, and yeah, then it's yeah. out of his mouth. Uh, yeah. OAN, the the same <laughs> dynamic, except you know now just because Trump was more belligerent and offensive to people's sensibilities, then it's being called out. But it just it was not done so in the Reagan era, is what you're you know alluding to. I would say. It, yeah, it, it was the same situation. His aides were going around. Um, saying we've got to temper this, temper this, this guy. He's he is saying things that aren't true. These are unfounded. And this is the time when you know you you couldn't, you really couldn't get away with this. You know, it, it would just you would look foolish. Um, but you know, it, it's a little different now. And the oh, you still can look foolish, but it's um, <laughs> it, it, there are there are fewer fact checkers. Right. And there, there is um, it's um, Donald Trump was able to get to get away with it. Reagan was, too. But he would go around saying, we've got to get rid of fiat money. Um, we've got to get rid of um, uh, he would make make these numbers up like for every three dollars that are sent um, uh, to the federal government, the American people get one dollar back. And it, it was just um out of thin air <laughs> it it really is it's it, I, I always remain so fascinated by just seeing mirror images throughout history and 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 i want to end on this last topic um and i'll let you go just about uh the John Birch Society's role in kind of putting forward even abortion conspiracy theories that we're still seeing today. I oh, mean, yeah. you, you write about how they would issue bumper stickers that said, support your local police and law and order. That was so, I mean, that was repeated through Nixon that must, that came from conservative think tanks and Reagan and stop the steal was even in existence back then. I, I, I read up a good amount on Roger Stone and you know, his, I don't know if he was directly involved with John Birch society, but it's just like those kinds of conservatives and how they're still felt so acutely today. Can you talk about just those social issues like law and order, policing, abortion, abortion. how the John Birch Society still makes its impact known on, on our discourse? 
Well, yeah, uh, the, the law and order, uh, you know, that is their, that is their signal um, calling. Richard Nixon runs on a, a campaign for law and order, but um, even before that, in the early 1960s, the John Birch Society had the support your local police organization uh, because they feared that the federal government was going to take over local police forces. Um, and as, as far as the, the social issues, they really get moving and they drive the social issues in the 1970s. It's amazing. Uh, Robert, Robert Welch, I, I realized in my research that he was in trouble in terms of the membership, but he did this brilliant thing. He established these ad hoc committees. Um, these ad hoc committees shifted the emphasis into organizing um, instead of recruiting full-fledged members. Um, these ad hoc committees weren't necessarily um, constituted by people who were members of the John Birch Society, but uh, they would support uh, social issues like motor read was the uh, was the social issue, and they supported. They were against abortion. Uh, they came out against abortion in the late 1960s, and it's not it's not until the mid or early 1960s that Richard Nixon realizes after James Buckley wins the New York seat um, for um, for Senate under the Constitution um, under the Conservative Party in New York that. Um, you can use abortion as a wedge issue, as a cultural issue to win elections. Um, and Richard Nixon changes his position. And a lot of Protestant, um, uh, Protestants change their position on abortion and, and, and become anti-abortion. Like W.A. Criswell was anti-abortion, was pro-abortion. Um, but there were so many Catholics in the John Birch Society um, and, and Welch was so far ahead of the game. He was pushing, um, especially his right-hand man, John McManus, Jack McManus, in the John Birch Society to be anti-abortion. So they drove that movement as well. So, Yes, and um, I, we've... And we could go on forever. I know yeah. uh, we're bumping up against our time, but I just, sure. the QAnon movement too is still, is so, it's all about the children and protecting the children. Like there's still so many of these threads, right? The the children are being, you know, yeah. uh, molested yeah. by these uh, satanic, like all of these conspiracy theories do revolve around some yeah. of the same trope. So anyway, fascinating yeah. stuff. Uh, Ted Miller professor at Northeastern University. Your upcoming book is called A Conspiratorial Life, Robert Welch, The John Birch Society and the Revolution of American Conservatism. Uh, thank you so much for taking the time. Oh, thank you very much. I really enjoyed the conversation. Thank you Appreciate very much. It.